Uh, my name is Rick Houlihan. I am a principal technologist for NoSQL at AWS. Uh, and that means I do a lot of DynamoDB work. Although I work across technology stacks, I do a lot of MongoDB and Cassandra as well. Most of the design patterns I'm going to be talking to you about today actually apply uh, to all NoSQL databases. Uh, they're going to be presented in the form of a wide column key value store, which is what DynamoDB is. Uh, if anyone's interested in figuring out how to apply those design patterns to MongoDB, track me down after the session. I'll show you how to do this in the document store as well. Uh, but I do this a lot, and uh, one of the big messages I like people to take away is there's really not a lot of difference uh, between the various technology platforms. Uh, the design patterns pretty much apply <coughs> across the board. So what we're going to talk about today, I always like to talk about brief history of data processing to kind of set the tone, the mindset for why, why are we even looking at NoSQL. And it's pretty important that we understand this because we've had this great technology for many decades, this relational database that seems to do everything. Uh, so why would I spend my time uh, learning this new technology, which is so, seems to be so uh, alien uh, compared to what I know already? We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll get into an overview of DynamoDB. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is a 300-level session, so it's going to be, uh, <coughs> you know, a very brief overview of the NoSQL uh, uh, service offering we call DynamoDB. Uh, and then we'll get really into the, uh, the meat of the discussion today. It's going to be about NoSQL data modeling. Uh, and we'll talk about normalized versus denormalized schema uh, and what that really means. Uh, how do we build data structures into a NoSQL database like DynamoDB? And then I'm going to get into some of the common design patterns. Now, historically or in, throughout the last couple of years, I've really focused on base ca use case design patterns. But this time, uh, we're really going to go deep into relational modeling. I'm going to focus on composite key structures uh, for the most part. We'll talk about how to translate hierarchical data models, how to translate relational data models <coughs> uh, into NoSQL. Uh, so this is really going to be uh, you know, representative of a lot of the work that my team does uh, which has been you know, working with global strategic accounts uh, as well as our internal Amazon retail teams uh, to migrate from relational database application services into uh, NoSQL databases. <laughs> and we'll close out with a real uh, uh, quick discussion or about serverless uh, and, and, and talk some about modeling real applications. And I'll give you an example of a real Amazon services uh, service that we did with a very complex and uh, a long list of access patterns. So, uh, again, first thing I like to talk about is the history of data processing, uh, and, and I love this quote. I don't know who said it, uh, but you know, listen to and look at what happened in the past so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past, and that's a lot of what this message is about. So if you look at the timeline of database technology, it's really break comes down to a series of what I call peaks and valleys in data pressure. Uh, and data pressure is the ability of the system to process the amount of data that I'm asking it to process in a reasonable cost or a reasonable time. When one of those dimensions is broken, that's a technology trigger, and we invent things. And we've done a lot of that invention over the years. So the first database we had was a really good one. We're all born with it, stuck between your ears, uh, highly available, right? When my eyes are open, it's, it's online. Uh, you know, but maybe questionable durability, about zero fault tolerance. Uh, it's a single user system. Uh, so pretty soon, we figured out that we actually need to do something better than that. And so we started writing things down. And we developed a system of ledger accounting, which is our first structured data store uh, that we had. And that ran public and private sector applications for several millennia uh, until 1880 US Census came along and a guy named Herman Hollerith was tasked with uh, collating and processing all the data that was collected. Now, if you're familiar with the US Census, it runs every 10 years. And it took Mr. Hollerith and his team about eight of those 10 years to process that data in 1880. And he figured out he needed to do something different. So he invented the machine-readable punch card in the punch card store sorting machine, and the era of modern data processing was born, as well as a small little company called IBM, which has a large and long and storied history on database technology. So rapidly, we developed many technologies <coughs> as public, public and private sector applications started to, to consume these new technologies and, and produce applications that required more and more and more data. So paper tape, magnetic tape, distributed block storage, random access file systems, and along came 1970 or so, <laughs> the relational database. And, and it's important to understand why we built the relational database. And we did it because storage was expensive extremely expensive. In the mid-80s, I was at Macworld uh, in Moscone Center in San Francisco. I was walking through uh, the convention center, and I saw in the middle of the conference room floor there was a truck transmission. And I was like, why is there a truck transmission in the middle? Maybe there was an RV show or something, and they couldn't get it out of there. And I walked over to look at it. And really, it wasn't a truck transmission. It was a hard drive from 1974, and it was cross-sectioned. It was really cool looking. But it had a sticker on it that said four megabytes, and MSRP, $250,000. <laughs> 
right? That's, that's pretty expensive. And now obviously we didn't use a lot of magnetic disk in 1974, but the point is that storage was extremely expensive. So normalizing the data, right? Reducing the footprint of that data on disk was extremely important and that's what we did. The, the, the relational data store is a wonderful way to reduce the storage cost of your application. And what does it do? It increases the CPU costs because the complex queries it must execute to produce the denormalized views of data that your application consumes, right? Joining tables, it's extremely expensive. So now fast forward 30, 40 years and the most expensive resource in the data center is actually the CPU, right? It's not the storage. So why would I wanna use a technology that's optimizing the least expensive resource in the data center? And this is really why we're looking at NoSQL today, right? Because we wanna do things more cost effectively uh, and, and more, uh, easier on the wallet, so to speak. So when we use new technologies, it's important to understand how to use them before we use them. And most of the teams that I work with uh, actually kind of fail this test. They, they kind of take their relational design patterns, they deploy multi-tables, you know, implementations, normalized data models in NoSQL, and then they wonder why is it not working? It's, it's so terrible, and it's really due to this effect. So uh, if you look at the bottom, this is the technology adoption curve. We're all very familiar uh, with this. Uh, in the beginning, we have innovators running around solving a problem, a technology trigger has occurred, right? The data pressure is too high in the system. We need something that's gonna be able to process this data a little bit more efficiently. They land on a solution. In this case, we're talking about NoSQL technology. <laughs> They have, a, they have a few people have some really good results and the rest of the market starts to move there. And as people start to deploy the new technology, they realize it doesn't work, right? Not for them. Their use case is different. The other people must be doing something or have a, a different application. Uh, the reality is no, you're probably just using the technology the same way you use the old technology and, and typically new technology doesn't work the same way. So if you actually learn how to use it first, you'll have a better result. And so if you look at the, at the bottom chart, the relational technology, that's way out on the right-hand side, the laggards, right? If you don't understand what a join is today, then you've been living in a cave for 30 years and I can't help you, right? But, <laughs> But, but if you don't know how to build a denormalized data model, well, that's fully understandable because no SQL technology is over on the left-hand side, right? That's where the innovators are still operating. We're still in that technology gap. People are still trying to understand this new technology. So if you take the time to actually learn how to model your data correctly in a no SQL database, you're gonna have a much better result. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. How do I actually model the data? <laughs> Before we get there, it's important to understand that you know, this relational database that we've been using for 30 or 40 years, well, it still has a very good place in the modern application, uh, you know, development environment. And that really comes down to what types of access patterns are we trying to deal with with this application service? Are they well known and well understood? Then maybe that's a perfect uh, a database or a perfect application for a NoSQL database, right? Where I have, uh, I have to actually structure the data specifically to support the given access pattern. And that's how come NoSQL data is, databases can be more efficient. But if I have the need to support ad hoc queries, right, it may be a BI analytics use case, an OLAP style application. That might not be the best application for NoSQL because NoSQL databases aren't really good at reshaping the data, right? They like simple queries, select star from. They don't like complex queries, you know, inner joins and calculate values and these types of things. No SQL databases are not very good at that. So um, if you, that's what it really breaks down to. The OLTP application is a excellent application uh, for no SQL databases and good for us, that's 90% of the applications we build because they represent very common business processes. Right, when I go to amazon.com and I order, uh, <coughs> you know, and I hit the order button, the same thing happens every time, and that's really the crux of when, it, when, it, when is it a good t decision to use a NoSQL database if I understand the access patterns very well, they're repeatable, they're consistent, then that's when we go to NoSQL. If not, then let's look at the, at the SQL database, right? So it's not obsolete, and it's just now we have a different choice. The Amazon DynamoDB is a fully managed NoSQL database. How many people in the room have actually run NoSQL databases at scale? I'm talking like, 50 or more nodes. Yeah, not very many. <laughs> when you get there, you will realize that managed services are really cool. <laughs> and most of the customers I work with have, 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 are, have scaled out their Cassandra clusters, they scaled out their MongoDB clusters, and oftentimes I'll work with them to kind of correct whatever mistakes they've made in their data models to get a little bit more life out of that cluster. But sooner or later, they're gonna say, you know, it's too expensive. 
Uh, it's hard to run this. I don't want to manage it anymore. Uh, I have a 724 knock that I'm staffing, you know, uh, 365 days a year to manage all of these, this, this infrastructure, whether it's running on EC2 or on-prem, it's irrelevant. It's the same cost, right? Server updates, patching operating systems and, 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 and software, uh, rebuilding storage devices, failed nodes, all these things. Nobody wants to do this. That's not core to your business. So the fully managed aspect of NoSQL database services is really the most powerful feature <coughs> that you can, you can have. Um, it's a document or key value store. What we really mean is it's kind of a wide column key value store that supports a, a document attribute type. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, and, and really scales to any workload is fast and consistent at any scale. DynamoDB has tables, single tables running upwards of four million transactions per second. Uh, with low single digit millisecond latency. As a matter of fact, one of the most interesting characteristics of DynamoDB is the busier it gets, uh, the more consistent uh, the low latency responses become, is because, and that's because we have a fully distributed request router, and as you start to hammer the request router tier more and more, the, the partition information of your NoSQL table starts to get cached across the front end. So there's no more lookups on that configuration table. So if you look at you know, services like Snapchat, uh, when, the, when the White Sox won the World Series, they were peaking out at 3.5 million transactions per second or so, and the graph is just really interesting because the latency drops to a very flat, low one to three millisecond range uh, as they approach their peak. Uh, and fully fine-grained access control in DynamoDB, we can uh, restrict the access to the items on the table, to the table itself, and to the attributes within the item. So if I have an application process that's running against a data store that might have items that contain information I don't want to have visible to my order entry clerks, but maybe they have uh, annotated data that's interesting, like maybe sales uh, person's commission data and whatnot uh, that I want to have access to sales managers. I can have those access patterns uh, hit the table with different IAM security permissions, which gives me a fine-grained access control uh, over the data and what people can read. And then it's a backplane service, which is really great when you talk about serverless programming, and we're gonna talk about that at the end of this, and why is that really a big value uh, to customers today. So DynamoDB has tables like all databases. <laughs> a table in DynamoDB is more like a catalog in a relational database. You're gonna put many, many items into the table, and the items in the table don't always have to have the same attributes. But they do have to have one attribute that uniquely identifies the item, and that's the partition key. So every attribute I insert into a DynamoDB table must at least have a partition key attribute. I can also contain, or, you know, include an optional sort key attribute, and when I do this, it gives me the ability to execute complex range queries against the items that are in those partitions. So you can think of the partition as now a folder or a bucket that contains items, and the sort key orders the items within that folder. And so when I query those, <coughs> those partitions or those folders, I can execute those queries with complex range operators. So in this example, let's say I have a partition key might be a customer ID and the sort key might be the order date. And I want the customer in the primary access pattern in the application is give me all of the customer's orders in the last 24 hours. And so I could say query the table where the partition key equals customer ID X and the sort key is greater than 24 hours ago. That gives me a nice, filtered list of orders by customer over the last 24 hours. So that's a really good way to maintain that one-to-many relationship. Uh, and you typically want to model the table to support one of your primary access patterns. When we get into the actual data modeling, you'll see what I mean by that. Uh, you always want that table to be uh, able to query something that is interesting to the application. Uh, partition keys are used to uniquely identify the item. They're also used to distribute the items across the key space. So every table in DynamoDB represents a unique logical key space, and we're gonna distribute those items uh, by taking that partition key attribute and creating an unordered hash index and laying these items out across this virtual key space. The, this is the way all NoSQL databases actually work, and, and when we scale the database, we're just gonna chop that key space up and spread those items out across multiple uh, physical storage devices. So now when I query the system, I'm gonna always provide that partition key as that equality condition so the system knows exactly which storage node to get to to go read that data. This is what makes all NoSQL databases fast and consistent at any scale. They, they, there's, a, there's automatic routing of the query to the exact storage node that needs to be served to service the request. When I include the range key or the sort key, <coughs> uh, 
in the table schema, now when I query and I provide that uh, sort key condition, I'm going to go into the partition, selectively read the items that are co-located on the same storage node and sorted using that sort key attribute. And this is, again, this is how NoSQL databases maintain that fast, consistent behavior. And this is not unique to DynamoDB. All NoSQL databases have this construct. Partitions in DynamoDB are automatically three-way replicated. So when I write to DynamoDB, you're going to get an acknowledgment from the client when two of the replicas have received that write. Um, <laughs> when you read from DynamoDB, then you have a choice between eventual consistent and strongly consistent reads. Um, typically, it's up to you how to do that. We recommend that you use the eventual consistent read because that three-way replication, the primary node to secondary is sub one millisecond. So, uh, you're not all that eventually consistent. It's pretty much by the time you round trip back from the client, the data is going to have replicated the secondaries. Eventually consistent reads are half the cost of a strongly consistent read because we have more nodes to choose from. When you make that eventually consistent read, I'm going to randomly read from one of those three partitions. If you make a strongly consistent read, I'm going to read from the primary node. Primary node always accepts the right, so you're going to get a very consistent uh, read on guaranteed strongly consistent read off of the primary, but it is twice the cost. So a cheap way to double the capacity of your application is to use EC reads. They are on, on by default, uh, so unless you change that parameter, uh, that's what's going to happen. Uh, local secondary indexes, well, we have two types of indexes in DynamoDB. We have local secondary indexes and we have global secondary indexes. Local secondary indexes allow you to resort the data in the partitions, right? So let's say in this case, I have uh, a need to get all the back ordered, you know, items for a customer. My primary use case is in the primary table, say order ID is the partition key, sort key is the date, uh, but on my GSI or my LSI, I'm going to create a partition key which is the same as the table, which it must be, which is the customer ID, and then I'm going to resort the data using maybe order state, right? So now I can query the LSI and say, give me all the back ordered items for a customer. Uh, and or I can query the table and say, give me all the orders for a customer within the last 24 hours, right? So it's a different access pattern. I'm going to resort the data to support that access pattern. But local secondary indexes must always use the same partition key as the table. So it's a way to resort the data, but not regroup the data. The alternative is to use a GSI or global secondary index. And global secondary indexes allow me to create a completely new aggregation of the data. So in the primary table, which might group the orders by customer, maybe my global secondary index groups the orders by warehouse. And I could say that my partition key on the global secondary index would be warehouse ID, and the sort key would be uh, order date. Now, if I need to get the orders for a given warehouse in the last hour, I can query the GSI by warehouse ID and with a sort key uh, operator saying greater than one hour ago. That would give me everything for a given warehouse in the last hour. So you're getting the idea. What we're going to end up doing as we model the data is we're going to start to use these indexes to regroup, resort, re-aggregate the data to support secondary access patterns, right? But using the same types of key structures. So it'll be interesting when we get into the modeling, we'll see some real world examples of how this works. GSI updates are eventually consistent. Uh, LSIs are strongly consistent. So it's something to remember when you're working with these. Uh, GSIs can, uh, when you make the update to the GSI, you're going to get the acknowledgment back to the client. Asynchronous process will kick off to update the global secondary indexes. Very important to know that the GSIs have to have enough capacity uh, allocated or the table could end up getting throttled because we need to maintain the consistency between the indexes and the table. So if you're writing data into the table faster than the GSIs can replicate, eventually they're going to back up. There's a small uh, buffer between the GSI and the table, but if that buffer overruns, we're going to shut down writes to the table uh, until the GSI can actually catch up. So important to know uh, that your provisioning on the GSIs uh, must match the throughput of the table. <laughs> All right, scaling NoSQL. Uh, technology does work. You just have to know how it works. Uh, but I like Douglas Adams, so I put this quote up there. Uh, but this is what bad NoSQL looks like. And this is what usually happens when people kind of don't understand how to use the new technology. If you look at this, this is a heat map. Uh, we'll run this for customers. I don't necessarily need to see this. Uh, I can look at a table's you know, cloud watch and say, OK, you're throttling and you're well below your provision capacity. That probably means you have a hot key. In this particular case, we have. Uh, 
partition count on the y-axis, we have uh, time on the x-axis, and you can see by that big red line, all of our access is hitting a single storage node. So remember I said key space, we chopped up that key space. In this example, we have 16 different partitions, but something in the application layer is causing a high velocity access pattern to a small number of keys or a single key, and it's causing one storage node to light up. And that is an anti-pattern in NoSQL, in all NoSQL databases. We can force this condition in Cassandra, MongoDB, DynamoDB, it doesn't matter. We want to distribute the access patterns, right? This is what NoSQL is about, is a fully distributed database. So getting the most <coughs> out of Amazon DynamoDB throughput, it, <coughs> it's oftentimes about uh, using partition key uh, elements with large number of distinct values, right? High cardinality sets. We don't want <coughs> uh, binary partition keys, right? True or false, in or out. Uh, these are bad partition keys because it's going to allocate, so it's going to aggregate so much of the data <coughs> into a small number of partitions. What we really want <coughs> are things like UUIDs, right? We want large numbers of distinct values, and we want to access those values uh, evenly over time. So let's, uh, <coughs> let's get all of our customers to line up and take a number, right? So we can get them to come in in a nice orderly fashion. We all know that doesn't happen, right? There's thundering herds, uh, all kinds of high demand access patterns. But if we can <coughs> get that data spread out and get those requests arrive uh, more evenly spaced over time, and oftentimes this is about distributing the data, we'll have a much better picture when we look at that heat map. In this particular example, I would probably tell this customer to uh, deprovision the table because it's not really doing too much. Uh, it's very much underutilized. I usually like to see a little bit more color. I just like to see things evenly distributed across that key space. I don't see those big red lines. We want pepperoni pizzas on these heat charts, right? So one thing to mention when we get into DynamoDB is the biggest value, one of the biggest values of Dynamo is the elasticity. Right? When, I, when I manage a NoSQL cluster like a MongoDB or Cassandra, I have to provision it for peak load. And it doesn't go away, because I can't take those shards away. I can't take those, those, those nodes off of the ring. Uh, I have to actually continue to replicate data and run those and manage that infrastructure, whether or not it's doing something. With DynamoDB, we give you a really neat technology to deal with the elastic demand of your application. This is a real application service that runs in one of our uh, fulfillment centers. You can see, like before, without auto-scaling, there was this high bar of provision throughput. Everything under that, that red line and above the blue curve is wasted dollars. Now with auto scaling, what happens is as, your, as the demand for your application increases and flows and ebbs, <clears throat> you'll see the auto scaling adjust the capacity on demand to meet the application's uh, uh, access requirements. So this is a really good way to uh, manage the cost of your database. Now, no, no SQL databases in general can't do this, so these managed services are really valuable. A managed service like DynamoDB is really valuable because it provides the elasticity, which is a huge cost savings over time. In the middle of the night when your application's not doing anything, uh, you don't really want to be paying for all of those server instances to be running, and so that's one of the nice things about Dynamo. All right, let's get into the NoSQL data modeling, and it's not for the faint of heart, right? But it wasn't really designed to be. It was designed uh, to, be, to maximize the efficiency of your access patterns. And this is one of the things that as developers, we're really going to have to understand and embrace because we're so used to developing with relational technology. And when you look at the data modeling in NoSQL, it's different. It's hard. Okay? There's a lot of differences between how I model data in NoSQL and how I model data in relational databases. But the bottom line is the data is relational. It doesn't stop being relational just because I'm using a different database. It's the same uh, e e entity relationship model that we're going to build and that we're going to manage and that we're going to have to support with the application service. And it doesn't matter what type of application that we're, uh, we're building, it's all the same. It's social networking, document management, IT monitoring, <coughs> you know, process control. Every single application you can think of has some sort of data model that is relational in nature. So how do I deal with relational data in a NoSQL database? A lot of people call NoSQL, they call it non-relational. I won't even, you'll notice I don't even use the word non-relational because the data is relational. It has to be or we wouldn't care about it. <clears throat> so when we get into how we've done that in the past, we've used this normalized model. And this is an example of a product catalog where I have uh, <clears throat> you know, products of three types. I have books, I have albums, I have videos. And you can see all the common relationships that we track and we manage with the relational database in this structure. We have one-to-one uh, -one between products and books, albums, and, and videos. I have a one-to-many between albums and tracks. I have a many-to-many -many that goes through a lookup table uh, to get you know, videos and actors, because actors can be in many videos. So uh, this is a complex set of queries that need to be executed. 
right, to get a list of all my products. Three different queries, joining up to four tables. And this is why relational databases cannot scale, because the CPU is going nuts, hopping all over the disk, pulling data off of all these tables, sticking it together in a denormalized view, and serving it up to the application layer. And on the flip side, when I need to update that data, because what I'm really doing when I execute those queries is I'm populating application layer entities, when I need to update the application layer entity, well, what happens? The data lives in multiple places. So now I need ACID transactions. <clears throat> right, so a lot of the need for ACID transactions <clears throat> is really the reason for that is because of the data model that we're using with relational databases. Sorry, I'm losing my voice, folks. It's um, been a long week already. <laughs> so <clears throat> maybe a better approach to this is to not do that. We don't want to burn that CPU like that. We want to take those hierarchical data structures. We want to collapse those things and build documents or collections of items within single partitions that represent these data hierarchies. And now, instead of having to execute three queries with various degrees of complexity, I'm executing one simple query that says select star from products. If I want to get all my books, select star from products where type equals book. Right? These are much simpler queries, much simpler access patterns. And you can see immediately why does the system scale better when I use this type of hierarchical data model, right, then this relational data model. It, because I'm not executing as, as complex an operation to assemble the view, I'm just going and getting documents or collections of items out of single partitions. I don't have to go and, and join data and create these views. So when it comes down to it, there's really just a few concepts we need to understand when we get into data modeling in DynamoDB. The key concepts are really about selecting the partition key and the sort key. As we talked about, this, the partition key is about large numbers of distinct values. Uh, we want things to be uniformly requested over time, so maybe some bad examples would be status and gender. Good examples might be customer ID, device ID, things that allow me to kind of distribute that data. Uh, selecting the sort key is about modeling those one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships that we need to support with in, the, in the data model and, and building a sort key that allows me to execute execute very efficient selective patterns. This is what we're going to get into when we start, start talking about composite key modeling in a few minutes. Uh, but it's about querying across entities. With a single trip to the database, I want to get all of the items that I need to support that access pattern. I don't want to have to go back multiple times, go get my customer item, now go get all the order items for that customer. That's a relational pattern. And I see this all the time when I work with developers because they're used to modeling data relationally, so they do it that way, and then their access patterns become very inefficient because I'm, I'm really managing that join at the application layer as soon as I do that. Right? So what we want is, uh, <clears throat> you know, maybe good examples of this, we talked about orders and order items, hierarchical relationships, which we'll get into uh, in a few minutes. As we walk through the process, and it's important to understand the differences in the process between modeling an application in OSQL and, and relational database. As a, as a relational database, all I need to do is normalize the data. Right? We have this neat thing, it's called third normal form. I could probably talk to any, almost anybody in this room right now uh, <coughs> who's listening to this presentation and say, here's my business problem, here's my entity relationship model, can you give me a data model for my relational database? And everybody would be able to sit down and build that third normal form. Right? Uh, and then we can argue about what queries are more efficient and add an index or two after the fact. But the reality is with, with NoSQL, it's the opposite. I need to understand every access pattern. I need to know exactly what the application is doing. Because if I don't, then I can't, I can't model the data in a way that's going to be efficient for that particular application service. So the first thing we want to do is understand that use case. What is the nature of your application? Is this an OLTP app? Is this an OLAP app? Is this a decision support system? There's a, a very different requirements for those applications, and, and really, there's one of them that doesn't fit, right? That OLAP application just does not fit with an OSQL backend. You know, define that entity relationship model. Know what it is. What, is. what is the data that I'm working with? What is the nature of that data and how is it related? And then identify what the data lifecycle is, right? What's my archive backup? Uh, do I need to TTL this data? How, what is the lifecycle of the data on the table? The next thing we're going to do is identify all of the access patterns of your application. So this is what I'll do when I sit down. I do my design reviews with customers. You know, how do we read the data? How do you write the data? What's the write pattern? What's the read pattern? Uh, you know, what are the aggregations that we're trying to support with, the, with this particular application service? And we want to document all of the workflows up front. You know, why? Because I'm actually designing a data model that's going to be very specifically tuned to those access patterns. 
And if I don't identify all those patterns, then I could be in a lot of trouble when I go out and try and deploy this thing. I might do a lot of work and have to unwind a, a lot of things I've done. So one of the things I hear a lot is use NoSQL because it's very flexible. I've done a thousand NoSQL applications. I can tell you nothing could be further from the truth. NoSQL is not a flexible database. It's an efficient database, right? But the data model is very much not, not, not flexible. Be again, because I'm building the app, and you'll see when we get into the actual modeling of this and how you actually build real services on NoSQL with complex access patterns, the more that I tune that data to the access pattern, the more tightly coupled to that service I am. So it's not really a flexible service, but it is a very efficient database uh, to use at scale. <laughs> then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually model the data. And this is where we get into the common mistake everybody makes when they work with NoSQL application. They start building multiple tables and they start building uh, you know, relational de uh, design models. It's about one application uh, service requiring one table. Right? And we're going to get into that when we talk about the data modeling in a minute. We'll show you some pretty complex services that have been modeled down to a single table, uh, and identifying those keys and how we're going to access the data and what are the actual queries that we're going to execute. Uh, define your indexes uh, for your secondary access patterns, and then it's just an iterative process. Right? Just like any development process, we're going to review, we're going to repeat, we're going to review, and we're going to get this thing down to a science sooner or later. All right, so complex queries. Right, it's all about the questions. Computers give you answers, but we have to, we have to ask the right questions. They're not always useless, uh, but you know, some people have thought so. One of the things that uh, NoSQL databases aren't so good at is actually answering those complex questions. Right? I mean, I need to know what is the count, the average, the sum, uh, the maximum, the minimum in a given set, uh, all kinds of complex computed aggregations, things that maybe stored procedures. One of the things about DynamoDB is really neat is this thing called DynamoDB Streams and Lambda. It's like the best stored procedure engine in the business because it's completely disconnected from the table space. One of the things that we did with Amazon's retail organization uh, and one of the reasons that we migrated off of uh, Oracle was because we had a problem with, with, the, with service teams deploying stored procedures into an Oracle server. It was shared across multiple teams and maybe somebody would deploy some bad code and all of a sudden we'd have three or four services or more going belly up uh, because you know, the, the, the processing space of the, the head node of the database server uh, got knocked sideways. <laughs> One of the nice things about Streams and Lambda is all of the processing of the data occurs in a different processing space than the table. So you don't have to worry about impacting the availability of your DynamoDB table. So we can deploy really bad code to Lambda. And it's not going to really kill us. We don't want to do that, obviously. So the way Lambda works is you know, it, it, it works in conjunction with the DynamoDB stream. Stream is the change log for the DynamoDB table. It takes all right operations, uh, will appear on the stream. Uh, once the data is on the stream, it can invoke a Lambda function. That Lambda function has two IAM roles. We talked about you know, the security fine-grained access control. <coughs> Lambda has an invocation role, which defines what it can see or what it can read off of the stream. Which items can it see? Which attributes in those items can the Lambda process actually read? And then it has an execution role, which defines what it can do. What other services within your AWS account space does it have access to, and what permissions does it have on those services to, to work with this data? So what do people do with this? In this example, not very much. It's just dumping those attributes out to the console, but it's code, and code can do anything. People do lots of things with it. One of the most common things we do with streams and Lambda uh, is uh, computed aggregations. Right, people need to understand what are the averages, the counts, the sums. You know, one of the nice things about MongoDB when you're working with small data is aggregation framework. How many people have used aggregation framework for MongoDB? A few, okay. Uh, I loved aggregation framework when I was at MongoDB until I had to scale it. <laughs> and I realized it doesn't scale too well. Uh, one of the nice things about this particular design pattern is as we read data off of the stream, we can compute these running aggregations, these, these counts, sums, averages, or complex computed metrics that we need to maintain at the application layer and then write that data back into the table as a metadata item. So for things like time series data, maybe I have time-based partitions. As I load those time series, those time-based partitions, I can execute my, my aggregation functions and produce all those time series metrics and write that metadata item right back into that partition. And a really neat thing about time series data is once it's loaded, it don't change. Right? So we, we don't have to worry about that metric having to be calculated a thousand times a second. The data gets loaded, the metric is calculated, and now it can be read a million times. And I don't have to recalculate it every time. This is what we want to do with NoSQL. We want to offload the CPU. 
We don't want to have to compute things. We want things to be pre-computed. So this is a really neat design pattern for that. We have lots and lots of customers that use that. Plenty of other things we can do with Lambda, update uh, cloud search or elastic search or other indexing systems, <coughs> push the data into Kinesis Firehose for stream uh, processing, interact with external systems. Again, Lambda is just code and it can do anything. Uh, the other thing you can do is it doesn't have to always be Lambda that reads the stream. If you have a high velocity workflow, then maybe Lambda is not the most cost efficient thing to use. Maybe I'll stand up an EC2 instance and create a static stream reader service. And um, that's perfectly acceptable as well. We have lots of customers doing that. So realize that Streams and Lambda is there for you to execute those stored procedure type operations or complex computed op uh, aggregations. Uh, certainly a valuable service for doing that. All right, let's get into what we deal with composite keys. Now I love this quote because it's perfect, right? Most people use NoSQL as a key value store. That's not the way that NoSQL is the most efficient way to be used, right? We want to actually store our hierarchical data in, uh, in the table, so to speak. So well, how do we do that? In this case, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know, composite keys. And in the use case here, we have uh, maybe players for a particular game. They have sessions. Sessions have state. Uh, what I'm interested in is all of the given uh, sessions for a given user that have a state of pending. So game invites, whatnot. In this particular case, I might have a table that is partitioned on the opponent that is sorted by the date. And if I want to get all of the uh, uh, sessions for a user Bob sorted by date and, and, and filtered on pending, uh, DynamoDB can support this because we give you two key conditions that you can actually evaluate, two range queries. Uh, it, it, the first one applies to the sort key. That's the sort condition. That's the date condition. So in this case, I'm saying there is really no sort filter. I'm just saying give me everything ordered by date. Since the sort key is the date, all the items are going to be returned sorted by date. That's great. But I'm really only interested in the pending items, so I'm going to say filter on pending. That's the filter condition. So the sort condition applies before the read. So it'll, it'll give me a nice selective read. The filter condition applies after the read. So it'll knock out the items that I'm sending back across the wire, but I'm still paying to read those items. So the cost of that read is the same as, as whatever the sort key dictates. Uh, this is okay in this particular example because I really only have three items and only one of them is being filtered out. All three of those items really are less than one RCU, so the cost of that query is the equivalent, right? Whether it was more, more, more selective or not. But let's say there was 10,000 items in this particular user's partition and only two of them were pending. Maybe I don't want to read 9,998 items just to return two. So one of the ways that I could do that, and the only way to do that, is to create a composite key. Composite keys are how we create hierarchies uh, on the, using the sort key structure. So if you think of what we're going to do here is we're going to take the status and the date. We're going to concatenate those things together. We're going to create one key called status date. When we push back to the table now, you can see what that view looks like. It's like a faceted search. I can say, give me everything for this particular user that starts with pending. It's going to give me only the items that are pending, and it's going to be a nice selective read. I could say starts with pending under bar timestamp one, or between pending under bar timestamp one and pending under bar timestamp two, and I get a range of items within a given state. And again, I get a query across states. So think of this like a faceted search type. And what I'm really doing is creating a hierarchy. And we'll show you how to do that when we get into the advanced data modeling here. And advanced data modeling is about thinking about the data, right? It does, nothing does itself. The way the OLTP apps use data again is about hierarchical structures. They use entity-driven workflows. The data gets spread out across tables and requires complex queries to be able to populate these application layer entities, it requires multiple queries to be able to, to update the entities. And it's a primary driver for ACID when we get into NoSQL databases. <clears throat> However, so when we denormalize the data and we create hierarchical data items, then maybe I don't need much more than atomic updates. There's still, there's still times when we might need uh, ACID transactions. Uh, one of the really good, one of the good ones is in maintaining the version history uh, or creating new items that actually get created in multiple passes and committed all at once. So in this particular example, let's talk about we have items on a table. These items have um, maybe a first item that we put into the table is the V0 item. Uh, you know, it's a copy of the V1 item and that maintain, contains the current uh, data for this particular partition. So when a customer wants to come in and get the most current version of that particular item, he says, select star from table where the item ID equals one, and the sort key starts with V0. 
is always going to get a copy of the current version. So if we look at the state of this given partition, it looks like somebody came along, they created item one. Initially, it was version one, and there was a copy of version one in v0. Somebody came along, they created version two, they committed version two, they updated the version zero item, they just clobbered it with the copy of v2, and they updated the current version attribute to indicate that it's now version two. So when the, when the reader comes along, says select start, where you know starts with v0, he's going to actually get that item, but he'll see that it's really version two. And now somebody's come along, they've created version three. But version three is not committed. Version three is just sitting in that partition. You know, some work's being done on version three. We'll execute multiple updates. We'll build this item in multiple passes. Eventually, we're ready to commit version three. So what do we do? We clobber v0. We update the uh, current version attribute to version three. And now any reader that comes into this partition and looks and says, give me the item that starts with v0 is actually going to get v3. So neat things about this particular pattern. I have an audit trail. Right, everything that changed, what version it changed across. You can decorate those items with the, you know, the who changed it. It's all kinds of nice things you can do. I get the same type of visibility I'm used to with ACID transactions, read committed, read uncommitted. I can read committed, starts with V0. Read uncommitted, scan forward index false, limit one, gives me the item that might be being worked on, so on and so forth. So it's a neat way to be able to maintain version history uh, and, and have some sort of transactional workflow against a single item. Now we get into multiple items, we're going to talk about starting getting into some real data modeling here. So in this example, I'm going to use a pretty simple, this is an internal service that we have at Amazon. It's a, it's a resolver service for configuration items. Configuration item, we create the resolver groups. We associate the configuration items to those resolver groups. <clears throat> and then we have contacts for those resolver groups. When new configuration items come in, we email all the contacts that are associated to a given resolver group. And so the data model looks something like this. We have a, re a resolver group entity. There's a many-to-many -many relationship between contacts and resolver groups and between configuration items and resolver groups. And there's a couple of transactional workflows that we have to execute. Right? We want to add configuration items to the resolver groups all at once or not at all. And a, and a, and a configuration item can belong to multiple resolver groups. So, and multiple configuration items might come in together. And we want these things to be committed to the resolver groups all at once or not at all. Uh, and then maybe contacts might need to be added to resolver groups as well, transactionally. We might want to update the configuration item data transactionally. There's a lot of workflows around here that require some transactional uh, uh, you know, uh, interactions with the data. And DynamoDB, if, if you're up to speed this morning or this after, early afternoon, we announced a really cool new feature, which is Transactions API. We have now a Transact Write Items, Transact Read Items API, where we can actually support synchronous updates, puts, deletes uh, across multiple items, full, at full ACID compliance with automated rollbacks, uh, up to 10 items within a transaction, and supports multiple tables, although you should not have multiple tables. <laughs> I didn't want them to do that, but they did that. <laughs> it's, it's okay. There's actually, there are use cases for multiple tables. It's, it's not, I try to drive things to a single table, but even myself, I'll get into the point where, no, let's split the data up. But it, generally speaking, it's a single table. So good use cases for this, commit changes across items. Absolutely love it. Conditional batch inserts and updates, right? We can have multiple conditions defined within a transaction. If any of those conditions fail, None of those items will get written. That's a great use case. Really bad use case, maintaining normalized data models. Please don't do that. So transactions is here for you, but it's not a crutch to make your relational models work. All right? uh, that's actually going to be a real bad pattern for you. So how does this work in DynamoDB with a single table? In this particular case, we have resolver group partitions and contact partitions. What we've done is created a pretty simple adjacency list. An adjacency list is a simple graph. As we denormalize the contacts across the resolver groups, what I'm really going to do is create a copy of that contact and reinsert it into the table with a different sort key. And that sort key is the actual resolver group ID. So now what I've done in my contact partitions is I have a copy of the contact for each resolver group it belongs to. If I need to add uh, uh, resolver metadata into the resolver group partitions, and then I'm going to add configuration items into those resolver group partitions as well. Now, when I get into the transactional updates here, <coughs> what's going to end up happening is maybe I have a configuration item I need to add to multiple resolver groups. Transact write API gives me the ability to execute that insert to both of those partitions and, and guarantee that both of those inserts will commit or not commit. Right? It's up to you know, when the transaction you know, API to manage that process, not the application layer anymore. 
Uh, maybe I need to update the transaction status. Maybe I want to cancel an item and I can add multiple conditional checks. I can say, you know, cancel this configuration item across all resolver groups as long as none of them are in progress. That's a really valid use case for us, right? Because sometimes configuration items get pushed into the system and somebody goes, oops, we don't want to do that. So pull it back, right? I need, to, I need to call that configuration item back. Maybe I need to update the contacts email, right, across multiple resolver groups, and I don't really want to do that uh, outside of a transactional envelope. Again, so multiple ways that we can execute uh, transactional rights in this particular use case. And this is a really good example of a single table design pattern that maintains a complex entity relationship model, right? Con we have configuration items, we've got contacts, we've got resolver groups, they all live on the same table. The metadata for all of that lives on the same table. And just to kind of show you how that, uh, you know, as we add one GSI to do our reverse lookup, right, I can look up uh, contacts by resolver group on the GSI. And we, remember we denormalized our contacts across the resolver group, so if I want to go back to the, to the reverse lookup GSI, I can partition, I can read the partition key for the, uh, with the resolver group ID and get all of the contacts for a given resolver group. Or I get all of the resolver groups for a given configuration item, right? Again, so all I've done is I've taken that table, that primary table, and I've created a reverse lookup on the, pri on the partition and sort key. So now the sort key is the partition key, and the, or, and the partition key is the sort key for the GSI. It gives you that kind of reverse lookup. So this is a way to be able to maintain many-to-many -many relationships, right? I mean, if you look, go back to the ERD here, we had, uh, oops, yep. We've got a many-to-many -many between resolver groups and contacts, uh, many-to-many -many between configuration items and resolver groups, and, and you know, in this particular data model now, I've maintained that many-to-many -many relationship across all of those entities using the primary table and the reverse lookup GSI. All right, getting into hierarchical data. That was a little bit of a, some data hierarchies we work with there, but this is another service we use internally at Amazon. This is for getting office information. If we go into our wiki page and we click on a particular office building, whatnot, this is the service that it's going back to or you search for offices. Uh, in, this given, in this particular example, we have pretty straightforward linear hierarchy, country, state, city, office. On the table, we're partitioned on the country ID. We're sorted on a composite key, which is the state, city, office ID. So now the access patterns here might be say, give me everything in USA in the United States. Query the table where the partition key equals USA, I'll get every office in the United States. I want every office in New York. Okay, country ID equals US. City starts, or sort key starts with NY. Gives me everything in New York State. Everything in New York City starts with NY, hash NYC. Gives me everything in New York City. So a really nice way to be able to take a linear hierarchy like this and just slice it up into a composite sort key and be able to support multiple access patterns, multiple groups, multiple aggregations. I don't need multiple tables. Again, if I tried to do this with multiple tables, just think of the access that I'd have to execute at the application layer. Oh, okay, let me get the country ID. Let me go back to the state and get me the states you know, in that country. Oh, right, okay, this, this state is New York. Let me go back and get all the cities in New York. Now let me go back and get all the offices in those cities. That's a lot of round trips. That's a lot of, that's a high latency and a very expensive operation that you're gonna be executing if you implement this in a relational pattern in NoSQL. Why? Because there's no joins in NoSQL because joins are expensive and that's why relational databases don't scale. So when you hear people say that NoSQL is missing joins, well, you say you're missing the point, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so complex relational data. <clears throat> we had a little bit of a picture of that when we were looking at that configuration management service. This is more of a, <clears throat> let's go into a theoretical delivery service, right? So I'm gonna, I created a fictional delivery service. It's called Get Me That. Get me that gets people things, right? Uh, people are busy, they need stuff, you, right? Download get me that, browse stuff, get stuff, tell us where to put your stuff, that's what this does. So it's a very simple service, but it's not a very simple <coughs> uh, entity relationship model. When we look at this, we have customers, vendors, orders, items, drivers, right? Customers place orders, vendors accept items from those orders, drivers deliver those items, drivers have status, current status, they have five minute status, they have 10 minute status, because we want to kind of schedule things efficiently, right? Uh, so let's see what that actually looks like. You know, when we get in the access patterns, we're talking about 10 or 12 different access patterns for this application, right? I want to get customers by date, uh, vendors by date, or orders by customer by date, and vendor by, by vendor by date. Order details, order items, status, delivery, you know, deliveries by drivers, driver status for scheduling. So it's a very complex set of access patterns, about 10 or, 10 or 11 access patterns we need to support in this given application. 
pretty straightforward thing to do with a relational database. Right? Just going to create this you know, normalized view of the data, execute a bunch of queries across here. But again, as we talked about, the joins are going to be very expensive, especially as we scale the data set. Right? And I've really noticed a trend. And I used to say that NoSQL is for OLTP at scale. And if you're not dealing with big data, then maybe you should be looking at other technologies. And what I'm really finding these days more and more is that the common app is becoming a big data app. So it's not so much. I really do believe these days that NoSQL is the future for the vast majority of workloads just simply because of the scale of the data. And these relational models break with when I try to execute those complex queries. So the NoSQL approach here, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but we're going to walk through it. This is all of that entity, all those entities stored on the same table. The first query I might get is, say, hey, get me the customer's information. And I would, I would query the table by customer email. That's going to use as the partition key. And I, my sort key value would be customer. Give me the customer item for this customer, for this email. That gives me nice, nice selective query out of that customer's partition. Give me the customer's orders in the last hour, in the last day, in the last week. I'm just going to timestamp all those orders. I'm going to insert those orders into the customer's partition by email. Now when I query the customer's partition by email, I used to give it a date range as the, as, the, as the sort key condition. I'm going to get a different set of items. I'm not going to get the customer's metadata. I'm going to get the orders that the customer gave over that time period that I've specified. So again, I'm slicing the data into these partitions, you know, out of these partitions to support the specific access patterns of the application. I want to get the vendor data. Anyone from Austin? Austin, to, there you go. You should recognize these vendors. <laughs> Some of my favorite restaurants. If you're ever in Austin, go to Torchy's Tacos. Love it. The best barbecue in Austin is Salt Lake. Anyway, so I want to get the vendor's data. I just select by the vendor ID. Uh, I want to get the driver data. I'm going to select by uh, the driver's email. I'm going to, I want the driver item. In this particular example, the drivers are drivers and the customers are customers, but nothing prevents me from using the same email for a driver and a customer. I would have different metadata or different items in those partitions. They would, all be, they would still support the same selective access patterns. As we even go further, I want the driver's status by five minute, 10 minute current status, five minute, 10 minute status. I can get that by driver. Just saying select by driver starts with GPS. We go, oh, and then we go into the indexing. So the indexing is about overloading the key. So if you look at the key attributes on these items, the order items are going to be sorted on the indexes by uh, email, uh, by order ID and email, uh, by vendor ID and, and date across GSI 1 and GSI 2. Then as we get into the drivers, GSI 1 is totally different. It's not using the same key values, but it's overloaded using the same name for the attribute. So we'll see when we get to the index, these items are actually going to show up. But I'm indexing the driver's GPS coordinates by sector. Because when a vendor's order comes in, he's in a particular sector, I'm going to want to know who, what driver is going to be available currently, five minutes from now, 10 minutes from now, whenever that order should be done. So I can do my scheduling. And then I'm going to, I'm going to index the order items across those GSIs as well uh, by timestamp and by uh, uh, customer and by timestamp and by vendors. So when we look at the GSIs now, it's kind of neat. When I go, I can query the GSI one, and I say query by order ID. It's going to give me all the items for the given order. It's going to give me the, uh, the customer that ordered it. That's a nice query. I don't have to go back and, you know, several times to the database to get multi if I have an order, I can get all of the metadata that's interesting, that's, that, you know, all the details for that order just by querying the GSI by order ID, single round trip. This is what we want to do with NoSQL data modeling. We want single queries to deliver multiple entities. In this case, the orders that the, or that the items for the order and the, and the customer's information delivered in one query. I can query by sector, and I can get drivers that are in a given sector and what their current status is in five minute or 10 minute intervals using the appropriate sort key conditions, right? Current status, five minute status, 10 minute status, by sector, right? So a nice way to be able to solve the traveling salesman problem, if anyone's familiar with that one. That's a tough one. This actually is a good way to do that. This, is, this comes out of a, a customer you know, uh, design review that I had with them. That was a problem they were trying to solve. If I go back to GSI2 now, I can query uh, GSI2 by vendor ID. I can query GSI2 by driver ID and get the uh, orders by vendor by date or orders by driver by date. What's the driver delivering? What did he deliver in the last hour? What's my vendor delivering? What's he delivered in the last hour? Right, so these are the access patterns of the application uh, <coughs> that give me the ability to support all of those you know, complex access patterns. I've got the entire entity relationship model stored in a single table. I have only two GSIs. 
So the other thing I hear a lot with DynamoDB is, you know, you only have five GSIs. We can't, we can't use DynamoDB because we only have five GSIs. I just showed you how to support 12 access patterns with, with, just, three, with just two GSIs at a table. Now let's get into a real world example, which is even a lot more complex. <laughs> and when we, when we talk about this service, this is the Audible eBook Sync service. This is how many people have uh, uh, Kindle. Okay, quite a few. If you have Kindle, you have uh, and every ebook you buy, there's a, uh, you have access, if you have a Prime membership, you have access to the Audible ebook version. Uh, and the Audible ebook is obviously uh, just, you know, when you play on your Kindle device, you play on other devices, uh, there's a lot of different relationships in this service uh, that need to be supported. So a, a given ebook can have multiple audio products associated to it because it depends on the device that's being played on, the format of the audio files that need to be played. An audio product can have many audio, audio files. Uh, <coughs> so there's a many to many mapping between ebooks, audio products, uh, audio, and, and, and then the ACR info table is the sync file information. So if I pull into the driveway listening to it on my Alexa uh, in my car and I walk in, I start listening to it on my laptop or my Kindle, I'm going to want it to start at the same place so that the, that ACR info file has a many-to-many -many relationship between uh, itself and the, and the audio products. And so these guys were out there trying to figure out, they had a lot of downstream and upstream consumers, they had 20 access patterns, they're trying to figure out how to deal with all of this with five GSIs. Right, select by ebook SKU, select by ASIN, select you know all kinds of different access patterns they need to support ACR info, ACRs, uh, and and so they were having a terrible time trying to map the data into uh, a, a single table implementation, and they were trying to and you're thinking about going down the relational approach. Uh, when we came in, we gave them a pretty simple table structure. As they insert the audio books into the table, one of the things they were interested in was the audit trail. When the A book ACR file changed, they wanted to know who changed it and why, so we gave them that V0 design pattern so they can implement, uh, you know, the current item is always V0 on the A book ACR. We, you know, we have two partitions on the table. We have the A book partition, we have an E book partition, and then there's an item that we insert into the A book ACR partition that associates the A book ACR to the E book. So once we have all of this data laid out, then what we've done is created the GSIs. There's three GSIs on this table. Uh, if you notice that the GSI 1, GSI 2, and GSI 3 don't always contain the same data type. And this is because, again, they have so many different access patterns. And what ends up happening is on the table, on the GSIs, it looks like nonsense. It's just a bunch of items sorted by all kinds of arbitrary dimensions. I mean, one particular GSI is totally, you know, who knows why, I mean, I might query by A book ASIN, A book SKU across multiple GSIs by pulling different items out. What ends up happening here is that the computer is what's reading it, the sort key is what defines what comes back off of the GSI, and what we ended up doing was just taking their 20 access patterns and extending the table, so to speak. Again, big eye chart here, but it's not terribly difficult. If you look at the first three columns, that's what they gave us. Then what we said is, okay, query this table or this index with this sort key condition and these filter conditions, and that will satisfy your access pattern. So these guys basically, we did three indexes, one table, 20 different access patterns. I have satisfied, or, or, or I've done single table designs for applications that need to satisfy up to 30 or 40 different access patterns. Okay, with extremely complex uh, ERDs. As a matter of fact, we have a really good chunk of, of information up there on the website for you. It's the uh, best practices for Amazon's DynamoDB. It was just updated about six months ago, brand new uh, uh, content, and it has a really complex scheme in there. There's 27 tables, uh, 30 different access patterns. It shows you how to map the whole thing into a single table. So I would definitely recommend that people take a look at that. It talks about uh, an extended design patterns, a lot more than the than what I've talked about today. And I'm totally running out of time, but I have one more thing to talk about. It's just gonna take a minute. Uh, <clears throat> it's a serverless paradigm. And if it's, uh, you know, one of the things about, I like this quote because it's, it's a, you know, Linus Torvalds told us, right? It was cheap home computing that changed his life. Well, think about cheap data center infrastructure because that's what serverless is. This is a really good example of an application we built for Amazon CDO, uh, or for, I'm sorry, Amazon's uh, SA organization. Uh, the, <clears throat> they wanted to be able to get customer feedback, anytime feedback. So if you get a, an email from an Amazon uh, SA, it's gonna have a link in the signature it says, you know, uh, rate my interaction. When you click that link, you're actually interacting with this application. It has a, uh, it'll pull down a, a, an HTML form from a uh, secure S3 bucket. Uh, when you hit the post button on that form, it interacts with the API gateway. 
API Gateway calls a Lambda function to process that data. When we wrote the application, it was, uh, we didn't have encryption at rest. So we actually had to push the personally identifiable information up into, a, into an encrypted S3 bucket. Uh, now we can, I'm sure they've actually changed the application to store it all on the Dynamo table. And that unencrypted searchable metadata was stored on DynamoDB originally. And then we would email uh, the manager and let them know that feedback had come in. A uh, really neat application we built very quickly. It just took us about a day or two uh, to actually design and deploy. It deploys for pennies a month is the support cost on this. Right? And, and the nice thing about this application is if it could scale to a, mu a million users if it had to, all I need to do is turn auto scaling on on that DynamoDB table and it goes. So that's a really neat aspect of serverless is that you can really get things out there. You can deploy it. It's cheap. That code just sits there until people actually need it. You can prove the application before you pay for it. It's not just fail fast. It's fail cheap now. Right? This is the cheapest data center infrastructure you're ever going to get your hands on for launching new application services. So I definitely recommend that you explore that serverless framework. Uh, so conclusions, no SQL is not non-relational. Don't use that word. It's a bad description. Okay, the ERD still matters. Uh, relational database is not deprecated, uh, but we want to use NoSQL for OLTP database, or for OLTP or DSS at scale. That's the sweet spot. Uh, and then use that RDBMS for your OLAP or OLTP when scale is not so important. Uh, but generally speaking, the common case is the big data case today. So thank you very much. That's what I have for you today.